In the year 357, the Roman Emperor Constantius II paid his only official visit to the ancient capital, by then a backwater far from the frontiers that were so much more concerned the emperors. We have a detailed description from the pen of the event from the pen of the great historian of the fourth century, Ammianus Marcellinus, who wasn't there. <laughs> the entry recalled a Roman triumph with a large military escort accompanying the emperor. And here we have a, a dish showing very probably Constantius II on horseback, preceded uh, to the right by victory, and on the left, one of his German bodyguards with a rather distinctive hairstyle, which we'll be seeing again. For this entry, Constantius was seated on a golden bejeweled carriage, and once he had entered the city gates, he processed towards the forum, and his demeanour clearly made a deep impression. Um, and I quote Ammianus in English. He was like a dummy, gazing straight before him as if his head were in a vice and turning neither to right nor left. When a wheel jolted, he did not nod, and at no point was he seen to spit or to wipe or to rub his face or nose or to move his hand. So, no random imperial gobbin. <laughs> Ammianus presents Constantius as if he were one of his own statues. Constantius stayed for a month in Rome, occupying the imperial residence on the Palatine, and here we have part of the model created by another Roman autocrat, Mussolini, showing <coughs> the imperial residence here in the centre, overlooking the Circus Maximus, um, and there are no points for guessing what that is. <laughs> And he visited many of the great historic monuments of the city, including the Colosseum, being particularly impressed by the form of Trajan, which is over here, which was then just over 200 years old. Ammianus stresses that the emperor was overawed by the achievements of the ancients and compared his own age unfavorably with them, sentiments that play well into our Gibbonian view of a declining and falling political and cultural order. The best Constantius could do as a contribution to the city's monuments was to arrange for a large obelisk his father had had brought from Egyptian Thebes to be set up in the Circus Maximus. Eventually he had to leave Rome because of renewed pressure on the upper and middle Danube frontiers. This vignette of the imperial presence in Rome features several themes that I, I would like to pursue here. <coughs> We'll go back to give you something other than me to look at. This is my inaugural lecture as Professor of Roman Archaeology, though quite what it is inaugurating I'm not really sure. It is now getting on for half a century since I first encountered archaeology, as Corey said, digging as a schoolboy on the 4th century cemetery at Bank Hills outside my hometown of Winchester. Ever since then, it has been the archaeology of the later Roman world that has remained my main preoccupation and indeed pleasure, initially focusing on Britain, but then developing a wider geographical and temporal perspective, in large part through field archaeology, through actually digging, particularly in France. For much the same time span, the later Roman world, or late antiquity, has been a major growth area of intellectual mm. endeavour and understanding, exciting intellectual times to live through. What I want to do in this lecture is argue the case for the distinctive contribution archaeology can make to these debates, because it draws on separate bodies of evidence of which it asks its own questions, coming up with answers that have their own authority, alongside those drawn from other sources and analyses. In order to do this, I shall, wherever possible, draw on projects I have myself worked on and regions I have myself worked in, and that is why this lecture will focus on the Western Roman Empire. I also want you to see why working here at Birmingham, um, alongside ancient historians, classicists and Byzantinists, to say nothing of e Egyptologists and Mesopotamianists, as well as a range of archaeologists now all gathered in the Department of Classics, Ancient History and Archaeology, has been a congenial intellectual environment. 
since an inaugural lecture is a personal statement, seeing some of my own experiences in archaeology may help you understand my intellectual formation. So, back to Constantius II and his visit to Rome, and some of the themes it embodies and which I want to draw on. Constantius entered Rome as a, a successful general, surrounded by his armies, but for much of the next month he lived in and visited great monuments of a character one might broadly call civil or civilian. I shall argue that this <clears throat> Janus-like facing two ways was a characteristic of the imperial office and of the late Roman elites more widely, and that some of what we see, an important part of what we see, is the gradual replacement of the values of the old, leisured civilian aristocracy by that of the new military strongmen who sought to maintain the empire's very existence. In addition, some of Constantius' military retinue on that day in 357 may well have been drawn from the barbarian tribes that were increasingly pressing on Rome's frontiers, and yet who were themselves, in important ways, creation of, creations of their proximity to Rome, and whom we know about largely through Roman writers. And I again draw your attention to this figure here. Not only does he have the Christian symbol on his shield, he has this distinctive hairstyle, which is all part page boy, part mullet, um, <laughs> and this large neck ring or talk. What all this points up is the importance of identity, the ways in which it was shifting through this period and the ways in which this is inscribed in the archaeological record and may be read off that record. I shall also argue that an important conditioning factor for these identities was the formation of different groups through their childhood experiences, be it formal education for some, or more broadly, the learned attitudes and behaviours that Bourdieu would analyse through the concept of habitus. Since this was a world in flux, within which individuals' identities might well be mutable, we enter also into the world of scholars such as Anthony Giddens with his notions of structure and agency <coughs> and their reflexive relationship, allowing structures to condition agents, but also agents to challenge structures, which may in due course lead to the structures themselves changing. Archaeologists are comfortable with such frameworks because identities and their mutations and the ways in which structures change were so often imbe embedded in the materiality of life and death and self-representation through mediums such as dress or food, embodiments that can so frequently be dug up. One other set of frameworks that archaeologists also feel comfortable with is that proposed by Bordel in his great Mediterranean world, the age of Philip II, especially the notion of durée, the long durée of deep time and fundamental structures and constraints, overlain by the moyen durée of shorter but still substantial periods, are ones which again accord well with the sorts of evidence we deal with. And for the long durée, I think particularly of colleagues looking at long-term environmental records, archaeologists, though, are usually less happy with identifying short-term conjoncture events, events, dear boy, events, <laughs> since our time resolution is generally too coarse-grained. So, when in my lecture title I speak of refashioning, I do not just mean fashion in its relationship to dress, though that there will be, but also, and importantly, as making and remaking. I think one could argue that Constantius II was, in his own way, rather conscious of what one might term the moyen durée, with his rather downbeat estimation of his own period in comparisons, comparison with the glories that had been Rome. Times had changed. For him, the conjoncture, the changing points, would have been the crisis the empire passed through in the second half of the third century, when a combination of invasion from outside and chronic wars of succession internally provoked massive military and political instability. Just to illustrate this, 
um, instability from which some at the time thought the empire would not recover. This is an image of an altar found only in 1992 in Augsburg. Uh, and telling of how a party of barbarians that had been raiding deep into Italy and was returning with thousands of prisoners was wiped out by army units and a local militia. But the altar was set up for the usurping so-called Gallic Emperor Posthumus. So in itself, this altar embodies some of the military crisis of the later third century. But late in that third century, the empire was stabilized by a succession of Balkan generalissimo emperors, here immortalized in porphyry, now built into the Basilica of St. Mark's Venice. These people come from the same area as later on people like Tito and Losevich came from. Um, I make no comment. <laughs> um, but what I do want to comment on here is the way in which they are portrayed not just clasping each other as, other as a member of the Imperial College, but shown as, in their military guise, as generals. Now, one of these figures must be, though unfortunately there is no inscription, Constantius I, grandfather of our Constantius II. Constantius I was one of two Roman emperors we know to have visited York. We know this because both of them died there. <laughs> Constantius in 306. At his deathbed was his son Constantine, who then usurped the imperial purple, and here he is shown in military guise. You can see on his shield Romulus and Remus and, and the wolf and also on his sort of hat badge, the Christian symbol, the Cairo. Of course, Constantine's treason prospered, so none dare call it treason, and he is now regarded as a legitimate emperor. Famous above all for being the first Christian emperor, and religion is, of course, another very powerful strand of identity, and which we shall encounter again. But what I want to concentrate on now is what Constantine did in the years from his usurpation in 306 till his march on Rome in 312 to confront the legitimate Western Emperor Maxentius in the climactic battle at Milvian Bridge just north of Rome where Constantine defeated Maxentius, aided, so Constantine thought, by a vision the night before of the Christian symbol. In these years before 312, he was based at the great city of Trier on the Moselle, where he commissioned the building of a suitable imperial residence <coughs> of which parts survive. <coughs> Above all, this enormous structure, built throughout of brick, um, very durable, so durable not even the RAF could bomb it into submission. Um, and this was certainly the Imperial Audience Hall, or Aula Palatina. Basilica with a K is a 19th century German term for it. Its interior, which is huge, you can imagine how huge by trying to put a human next to the altar or in the pulpit. Uh, this is the architecture of domination on a big scale. Um, but sadly, it now lacks all its interior decoration, of which fragments did survive down to the 18th century, and it would, again, have been there to overwhelm. What I've done here is put the interior of the Basilica with the interior of the 5th century church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, and in fact, these mosaics here are original. Now, okay, there are all sorts of differences, but I'm just trying to give you an impression, and the importance of materials marble, mosaic, and so on. And in the case of the Basilica, Constantine would presumably have sat enthroned there. Santa Maria Maggiore is for the celebration of the Christian liturgy, the Tria Basilica for the liturgy of the imperial presence. 
The basilican form derives from the palace at Rome, which Constantine, uh, Constantine's son Constantius was to spend time in, as was Constantine himself. And it could be seen as part of the sort of civil character of the emperor. So Constantine builds this great basilica in Trier, which many generations of emperors, bureaucrats and aristocrats would come to know, and the palace round about it. Now, a few miles upriver from Trier is this little villa at Ons, which we think is the Contionarchum, where the Emperor Valentinian I, half a century after Constantine, signed an edict one day after he had signed one at Trier. And you can see the little scaled down basilica at the centre of it here. Now, Valentinian had come to the throne because of military prowess. And I show him here in military dress on the reverse of this coin. And there's the Christian symbol again. Here he is dragging a barbarian captive. Um, I've chosen this rather scrubby coin rather than a pretty one because it again relates to my own experience. Um, when I was undergraduate, I was taught how to identify Roman coins from excavations, things that looked like this and far worse, uh, by my then tutor, Richard Rees, in what would now, of course, be regarded as a scandalous waste of his time. Ever since, coins and their place in reconstructing the ancient economy have been one of my interests. Now, even if Valentinian was himself a military man, he knew the need for and value of a good traditional education for an aristocratic child such as his son, Gratian. Accordingly, he summoned as tutor to the young prince one Decimus Magnus Orsonius. Orsonius was a grammaticus, a teacher at the schools of Bordeaux. Provincial academic makes good. <laughs> a grammaticus was a teacher. And here is a second century re famous relief of a schoolroom scene from Neumagen in Germany with the Grammaticus, two of his students, and a late arrival with well, probably not his lunchbox, but his, his wax tablets. Right. A Grammaticus was a teacher of the knowledge of speaking correctly and of the explication of the poets. In other words, he was responsible for inculcating into the sons, occasionally the daughters, of the elites um, a mastery of correct Latin, sometimes also Greek, along with a knowledge of the canonical authors in the literature of the Greco-Roman world. What the Romans, what the borrowing a Greek word called paideia. Um, indeed, it's an education not unlike the one I myself received a millennium and a half later and was receiving <coughs> when I was seduced and suborned by archaeology. Such an education fitted the late Roman gentleman to take his place in the imperial aristocracies and bureaucracies of the empire. He could fit in with others who had received such an education, form bonds of friendship and patronage, and doubtless sneer at the uncouthness of the unlettered. A considerable amount of Orsonius' own poetry survives, and though it is largely not to modern taste, it does show the effects of such an education. Here we have, for the benefit of my classicist colleagues, a passage from his Kento Nuptialis, <coughs> a nuptial poem. A kento was a sort of patchwork or something assembled from bits and pieces. In this case, lines and half lines of Virgil. To do this requires a deep knowledge of the literary canon. Now, okay, Orsonius was a teacher, but this shows how much it had been in, um, in the jargon internalized. Even I can recognize from the first line, Sola sub nocte umbram. Uh, from my own A-level in the book six and the Descent to the Up Underworld. The penultimate line, monstrorend in form in gens, the horrific, formless, huge monster, 
Uh, <coughs> Virgil originally used this to describe the Cyclops Polyphemus. Uh, I'm afraid Orsonius here is using it to describe attributes of the bridegroom. <laughs> Late Roman smut. <laughs> One of Orsonius' more digestible poems treats of his life on his Herediolum family estate in southwest Gaul, an area where he remains to this day a revered figure, even if we don't know where the estate lay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Orsonius brings me from Trier, where I have not worked, to the southwest of France, where I have worked, um, and to which I now want to turn. Um, particularly the area bounded by the Bay of Biscay, the Pyrenees, and the River Garonne. For those of you who know this area, Toulouse is about there, and Bordeaux is up there. No lecture by an archaeologist is permitted to happen without a distribution map. I would be in trouble with the Institute for Archaeologists if I didn't. Um, but this one shows the incidence of late Roman mosaics on the territory of modern-day France. And as you can see, it's a very skewed distribution with a massive concentration here in the southwest. If it had gone beyond the borders of France, there'd be a, a little cluster around Trier up here on the Moselle. And there would be a lot, as we shall see, in Britain. These mosaics are overwhelmingly to be found at villas, the country residences of the aristocracy. Here we have a plan, I'm afraid it's a bit dull, but there we go, of a large villa at Saviac, which I choose partly because it was only about 10 miles from Ailes, where, as Corrie said, I, I worked about 10 years ago. Um, notice the Basilican reception rooms, that's an earlier version replaced by a larger later version. So this is the influence of that great audience hall at Trier percolating down. Here's a, a model <coughs> of the site, there's the Basilican rooms. And I just wanted to show you the massive bathhouse here, um, another feature of the, many of these late villas bathing, not just for getting clean, but also a, a space for social interaction, for, we would put it now, networking. Um, and in the late Roman Empire, increasingly at private buildings, private estates, where, of course, access could be controlled in a way that it couldn't be in the old public baths of the <coughs> earlier empire. And <coughs> Saviac has a large number of polychrome mosaics, and this is one of the plunge baths within the bath suite at Saviac to show that. So, mosaic again, as at Basilica, at, at Trier, and other imperial residences. Grander even than Saviac was the extraordinary complex at Chiragon, to the southwest of Toulouse, on the, on the Garonne. Uh, uncovered in the early 19th century, and here is the plan, or part of the plan of it, with 4th century modifications in blue. <coughs> Grand trou de décombre, big hole with rubbish in. <laughs> um, not so much rubbish, an extraordinary collection of marble sculpture. Some of it, as you can see here, of the highest quality. A series of panels showing the 12 labors of Hercules, along with many statue uh, busts of imperial personages from the first century through to the early fifth. Uh, if one goes to the Musée saint aimé in Toulouse now, where it's all laid out, it is very, very impressive. The marble is from the Pyrenees, not far away. But the style of the sculpture is of great sculpture school at Aphrodisias in modern-day Turkey. So these people had far-reaching connections. The sculptures are probably second century, reused in the fourth century villa, but of course these people would see no contradiction any more than an 18th century gentleman who'd been on the grand tour would see a contradiction in using antique sculpture in his nice Palladian house. So again, we have here 
people who are making statements partly about their paideia, their culture, their education, their knowledge of the classics, uh, but partly also citing themselves with reference to the past. What these southwestern Gaulish villas show, I would argue, is the importance of the civil mode of aristocratic self-definition and self-representation. The imitation of imperial models such as Trier is clear. Indeed, I would argue that the regional groups of such lavish villas in the late Roman West, such as in southwest Gaul or southern Britain, um, are where they are precisely because these regional aristocracies were linked into the imperial court and the imperial service. And so such an architectural and visual language was central to their vision of themselves. Uh, perhaps the best known of these southwestern villas is here at Mont Morin, uh, best known largely because it's been fully excavated and laid open. But this brings me close to a site which Corrie mentioned I worked on, to which I now want to turn, the site of saint bertrand de Comminges. So just to orient you, Saviac with its mosaics was about there, Chiragon and its sculptures is about there, and Montmartin is there, north of saint bertrand Now, some of you may have heard or have a faint memory of the name of saint bertrand de Comminges, not from an archaeological context at all. Um, the opening story of the great M.R. James Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Canon Alberic scrapbook, is set in saint bertrand and you can see perhaps why the site made such an impression on M.R. James on one of his cycle tours of French cathedrals. There is the cathedral on its great rocky dump, and here a nice little 11th century funerary basilica, in fact largely built out of the remains of the Roman city of saint bertrand And in the mid to late 90s, my colleague Jason Wood, who sadly can't be here this evening, um, he and I worked on a project on the late Roman walls which surround the top of the hill, particularly this area here next to the Arkin. Um, Jason is an expert in standing structures, so he surveyed and analysed standing structures. I'm an archaeologist, so I dug holes. <laughs> And this did mean that we were able to date these defences for the first time to the early 5th century, somewhat later than was suspected. And <clears throat> Jason realised that embedded in later medieval rebuilds was actually the top of part of the late Roman wall, including the wall walk, the parapet, just to see the bottom of an embrasure here, and these traverses or buttresses. Uh, an extremely rare survival, and we were allowed to do what we wouldn't have been allowed to do in this country, which was dismantle the frankly very undistinguished medieval rebuilds after the them, um, to get at the, get at the surviving Roman. Okay, that, that's fun, but the point I want to make is that here we are back to the other great complex of self-representation in the late Roman world, the military. From literary references and their appearance on mosaics or in manuscripts, we know that walls were the embodiment of the late Roman city in the way that a forum or baths would have been under the early empire. So we should see the walls of saint bertrand not just as defensive, but also as a monument of status and prestige. In the words of Boethius somewhat later, not only a necessitas bellorum, indispensable in war, but also ornatus parcus, an ornament in peace. And this can be seen even more clearly in another set of French late Roman walls at Le Mans, this enormous tall tower with the walls to either side, carefully ornamented in different colored stones. Yes, it's very defensible, but it's also making a statement. And it's not only architecture that makes these statements, it's also one of the most commonly found classes of objects 
from excavations, to which I shall return, the dress fittings of late Roman soldiers and officials. Um, here, a tomb painting from Bulgaria, where I have not worked, but my colleague, Professor Andrew Poulter, who's kindly come over this evening, has worked, which is why he sent me the color version here. Here, a late Roman official and his wife, and here, his servants bringing him his long johns, his cloak with a brooch, and his belt set, which was the symbol of his being in state service. And note that this one, again, has that funny haircut. I shall return to belts and brooches in due course. So, as you can see, um, my work abroad has been very important to me in enlarging my horizons geographically, but also making me think of ways um, and in ways which I might not otherwise have done had I stayed this side of the channel. What do they of Britain know who only Britain know? A question that has increasingly preoccupied me in recent years. I started my career, as Corey said, indeed was appointed here, as a Roman Britain specialist. One of the besetting faults of the study of Britain in the Roman period is that it can be insular, not just literally, but also in the bad sense of isolated and un unwilling to look outwards. I'm afraid this is in large measure due to the foreign language problem which so many Brits have. But when dealing with any period of Britain's past, this is self-defeating especially so perhaps in a period when Britain formed part of a large empire and was thus particularly susceptible to influences from across the channel. This is a tendency I'm particularly keen to counter by informing more monoglot colleagues of what was going on across the channel, as Corrie said, and how it might affect our understanding of Roman Britain. And the converse, I try regularly to con convince my French colleagues that the land's outre-manche consisted of more than the Mur d'Adrien, um, and that in the late Roman period, southwestern Britain recognizably formed part of the same world as southwestern Gaul. I want here to look at two projects in Britain in which I've been involved, both to show the widest perspective helping to understand them, and also to show more of how archaeology contributes. The first of these is a project with which I'm still involved. So it's you know, so recent, it's not yet over. Um, and it's to do with the Romano-British villa at Chedworth, near Sirencester in the Cotswolds. Um, this is a map showing villas with, with or sites with mosaics in the fourth century in these counties, Dorsetshire up through Somerset, Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, Herefordshire. If you can think back to that map of France and the, and the way in which mosaics were concentrated in the southwest, something similar is happening in Britain. Here is the site of Chedworth, which, as you can see, is one of the few Romano British villas which is uncovered and can be visited. Here it is, not long after the Second World War. <coughs> It was uncovered, I hesitate to say, excavated, in 1864. So it is now 150 years that it's been waiting for a definitive publication. A long time, even by the competitive standards of archaeological non-publication and back -up. It is now in the care of the National Trust, and I got involved when the Trust had obtained funding to build a new cover building to replace the somewhat decrepit 19th century ones, particularly this area here. And they needed a narrative to explain to visitors what this rather rebarbative site was about. Um, it's not easy to visit and understand what's going on. Um, so they wanted a narrative to try to make sense of it and to inform signage, guidebooks, so on. So Jason Wood and I, again, the, the ter terrible twosome, 
um, are again working on the final publication of the villa. Jason again on the standing structure, me on everything else. Just as an example of how difficult the site is to understand nowadays, here's the standard plan of it. Um, I defy anybody to make much sense of it, me included. Particularly this area here. Terrible mess. But when I looked at the earliest published plan of the villa by George Fox in 1887, I had what one might call an epiphany. Because this area is now much simpler. And I looked at that and I thought, ooh, I know what that is. I've seen those before. It's one of these basilican reception rooms. And so I thought, right, let's, instead of making this part of the baths, which had been the case, what about if this is the main reception room and here we have a large antechamber? Last year, and this is looking from this is looking from here eastwards, particularly the western half of this room. Last summer, the National Trust excavated half that room and showed it had one single large mosaic covering the whole of it. Uh, we also know there's a bit of the mosaic there. It is indeed one single large room. It could well be a reception room. This is a mid fourth century mosaic. The apsidal room is just off to the left here. Oh, the smugness of it all. <laughs> <laughs> but what the idea about a basilican reception room made me realize was that if I applied my knowledge of contemporary villas, for instance, in Southwest Gaul, and of late Roman aristocratic behavior more generally, then perhaps Chedworth would make more sense and would have a story to tell visitors. So here is a reconstruction of that part of the villa, published last autumn in that well-known archaeological journal, Country Life, <laughs> impact, showing the basilican room, the large reception room, and I've had them all done up to the nines, but. Again, I think this was the archaeology of architecture being impressed, with next to it the bath suite, which has allowed, so here we have the Dominus, the Lord and Master, receiving visitors, and here the art, we've been allowed to put some gender in, though it does, it did give the artist the chance to show ladies with no clothes on. Um, Baths and their place in villas, I mentioned when talking about Saviac. I'd also just like to point out the Nymphaeum here, the little shrine collecting the water of the spring. Here's a view of Chedworth Villa pretty much as it is now. Uh, we've just been looking at this area. There's the new cover building, sort of very Japanese. Um, this is partly why it's so difficult to understand the villa. Um, these walls with little roofs on are quite cute, but roofs normally go on buildings, not on walls, and so the general public finds this confusing. And in fact, Jason's work has shown that basically everything you're looking at here is either 19th or 20th century, not Roman at all. Um, but in the centre, there is this shooting lodge constructed only three or four years after the uncovering of the villa by the then landowner, Lord Eldon. So during shooting parties, he could bring his guests there for lunch and they could have a wander around the picturesque Roman ruins. And indeed, the woodland round here, which is still part of the Stowell Park estate, only the villa itself was carved out and given to the trust. This is part of the Stowell Park estate and that's where Lord Vestey's pheasant cupboards are. It's a, a hunting landscape in modern times, but interestingly, it was the same in the Roman period. Um, excavations at Chedworth, ever since 1864, have turned up lots and lots of antler, deer antler. And this is not antler that's been shed, this antler that's been hacked out of a, well, a presumably dead animal. Uh, there's this nice sculpture of Diana Glenatrix, um, brings me back to the question of sculpture um, with a little bit of gesso preparation and some paint it might have looked quite good and 
about 10 years ago by a colleague Maureen Carroll at, at Sheffield, uh, did a small excavation, produced the usual collection of animal bone, but Andy Hammond at York was worried about the pig bone, and so he sent it off for DNA testing, and it's not domestic pig, it's wild boar. And the only reason why you have wild boar at a site like this is because you've been hunting it. Now, hunting is, was a Roman aristocratic <coughs> pastime um, for which there is a great deal of evidence that needs systematizing. Here I would just like to flag up the implications for the realm of landscape archaeology. Hunting landscapes, parks, chases, forests from the medieval period are well known as, as landscapes of power and prestige and control. Do we need to start thinking more about this in terms of the Roman period? Since its discovery in 1864, this exceptionally fine mosaic has been universally accepted as flooring a large formal dining room, a kenatio, with the seating on the planar geometric panels uh, looking out at these figured mythological scenes. So here on the fourth floor of a 4th century building in Western Britain, we have scenes from a very traditional Greco-Roman myth cycle. Why? Traditionally, this has been inter interpreted in terms of Romanization, that these are people who wanted to emulate Mediterranean culture, Roman culture. Um, I've never been terribly happy with that, because it essentially implies that this is a veneer. Um, I think it goes deeper. I think if one goes back to notions of paideia and the education of the young, particularly young aristocratic men in the language and literature of the Greco-Roman world, these are ways in which the man who commissioned this, almost certainly a man, uh, would have learned, this is what he learned as part of education, they are the myths and literature that he would deploy to show to his peers, possibly his superiors, his social and moral standing in the hierarchy of the late Roman world. And of course, as Catherine Dunbabin has shown, late Roman formal dinners followed a, an almost ritual sequence and were much to do with social display or with making some terrible social faux pas. And here is a, a late Roman dinner, banquet of Dido, semicircular stibadium couch. Notice again the page boys, the servants with that particular hairstyle of a sort of pet Germans as, as um, serving the, the guests. Quick last point from Chedworth. Two coping stones from the Nymphaeum, that basin which gathered the water, had the Cairo, the Christian symbol. Um, but then were found reused as building rubble in a set of steps. It looks as though the, the religious controversies of the fourth century were being played out here. In my end is my beginning. You'll be glad to hear, particularly the end bit. Um, as Corrie said, and I said earlier, the first site ever I worked on was a fourth century cemetery outside Winchester, the site known as Lang Hills. And here is a view of part of that cemetery taken by the 19-year-old me. Um, and I worked there, and we excavated between 1967 and 71, 444 graves. A nice, easy number to remember. The photograph I've just shown you is essentially of, of this area here. The great majority had no grave goods. A few had the odd pot or coin or pair of hobnail boots. But a very small group of male burials was more elaborate. To start with, they had simply more objects with them. And here are some of them. In those days, such things were called small finds. Nowadays, they bear the more dignified appellation of material culture an area that has made major advances in the last 20 years or so and continues to do so. 
At one level, the, mat the material culture of these graves shows links with the late Roman state. Brooch here, belt buckles, bits and pieces. And if you remember, that is one of those brooches, the importance of the belt suite as a, as a marker of imperial service. But it was not just the objects themselves, but what might be termed their social context as shown by the burial rite. The excavator noted that these brooches, there they are by the right shoulder, which is where they'd be worn in life, and the belt suites were pretty much where they ought to be. It looked as though, unlike the majority of other burials, these burials went to their long home clad. And so the excavator, um, Giles Clark, looked for parallels for this burial rite and finally came up with, uh, with close parallels in the area of Pannonia, in roughly sort of Hungary area, the middle Danube. And some of the cemeteries in Central Europe seem to go out of use about the time that these burials start arriving at Bank Hills in the middle of the 4th century. So, Giles Clark interpreted these as people transferred by will of the late Roman state from Central Europe to Winchester. For purposes we're a bit unclear about, but nonetheless, it was his argument. And there's more to it because it wasn't just the men, it was the women and children as well. There was a group of anomalous burials, again, in that they had lots of objects with them, particularly the children, with an emphasis on bracelets. And the children tended to wear large quantities of bracelets on their left arm. The adult women, a small number, very often on their right. Is this to do simply with age, or is it to do with marital status? But the objects are all of standard Romano-British types, which pose the question, are the women folk also from Pannonia, but buried with local Gugors, or are they Winchester girls who married Pannonians? At the time, it was impossible to tell. But in the opening years of this century, this millennium, <coughs> a further area of the cemetery was excavated. The bit we worked on is in sort of orangey beige. The Oxfordshire unit dug a large extra chunk which had more of these distinctive burials, and there is one, the grave goods from one brooch, belt fittings in silver, and uniquely from Langhill's spurs, which seem to be very high status markers. So, could we get, could they, could we get any further on the question of Pannonians? Well, yes, because in the intervening time, a new technique had been developed. Um, the use, the analysis of stable isotopes. Now, basically, during childhood and adolescence, um, laid down in the bones are isotopes derived from such things as groundwater and from foodstuffs which people consume. And these tend to be very local to the area in which they're living. Um, once bone formation song finishes in adolescence, this stops. So you can at least try to show if somebody has been buried at the end of their life far away from where they started their life and grew up. And the most commonly used isotopes are strontium and oxygen, though others are being developed. Um, here's the plot for the burials sampled um, in, at Lang Hills. When it says locals, Pannonians and others, what they're doing there is talking about Clark's classification of the burial right. So we're looking here at burial right. And as you can see, there's quite a scatter. And the Pannonians, so-called, certainly don't form a discrete group off to one side, distinct from the locals. In fact, 
It's the locals who go on to the place. <laughs> but this is local burial right. Mm. If I tint more closely um, the Winchester drinking water range, and you can see there are quite a lot of so-called Pannonians. The UK, so by implication, a large proportion of these burials grew up outside Britain, both exhibiting the local burial rite and the so-called Pannonian burial rite. But in fact, only one of the so-called Pannonians, and it's not a very good Pannonian, um, <laughs> comes from a cold area such as might be Central Europe. So do we have here the second generation problem? That we're looking here at Pannonian children who grew up in Winchester, drank Hampshire drinking water and ate Hampshire hog, mm -hmm. and therefore show up in their bones as local. Um, it's rather like, if you did this, if you analyze many Indo-Pakistani or Afro-Caribbean heritage people in Birmingham today, they would show up as Brummies. Um, well, indeed, as a student once pointed out in a seminar, they'd probably show up as Welsh, given where Birmingham gets its drinking water from. <laughs> now, some of these come from further afield, and on the whole, they come from hotter areas, hotter in terms of temperature. And that includes some of the so-called Pannonians. Well, clearly this hasn't resolved anything. It has created confusion, which on the whole I prefer. A couple of right answers are so dull. Um, but what I find most striking is the proportion of people, of, well, of the sampled population of 4th century Winchester who don't come from Winchester or nearby. We tend to imagine that these places were fairly local. They, they lived in small worlds, except for maybe the odd trader and bits of the army and so on. But clearly, this was not the case. These people, like all those <coughs> accompanying Constantius on his visit to Rome, travelled long distances. This was a very mobile world. You thought you were going to get away with it, didn't you? You thought you were going to listen to a lecture by an archaeologist with no pots. <laughs> <laughs> well, like distribution maps, pots are compulsory. And here we have, from the grave containing the, as it were, hottest um, isotope signature at Lang Hills, a pair of small unguentaria ointment vessels, which almost certainly come from North Africa. Now, whether this means the occupant of the grave also came from North Africa is very much more debatable. But they started their life a long, long way from Lake Roman Winchester. And we're in the 4th century, the opening of the great period of migrations, the Fokabangaru site. What if not only the barbarians migrating into the empire, but also the populations of the empire itself were also hugely mixed and mobile. The, the potential for constructive confusion is great. My peroration, and I shall illustrate it with an enormous silver dish from West Central Spain showing the Emperor Theodosius I last ruler of a unified and undiminished empire. Again, you should be getting used to these people with their hair and their neck rings and their shields. Theodosius, accompanied by his two sons, Arcadius, who became emperor in the east, and the Gaulless Honorius, um, emperor in the west, under whom Rome was sacked in 410. This lecture has ended with some fairly hard archaeology, stabilised topes, ceramic analysis, material culture. In the course of the lecture, I've touched on many aspects of archaeology, some more than others. I've mentioned the staples of much archaeology, structures, burials, material culture, for all of which I hope I've demonstrated just how much they have to contribute. 
If I've said less about topics such as landscape archaeology or environmental archaeology, this is not because I do not esteem them, but because I think their potential is yet to be realised. Can we yet recognise a late antique landscape or bone assemblage or beetle spectrum? The subject will be that much the stronger when we can. I hope I've also shown you why the Department of Classics, Ancient History and Archaeology is a good place to research and teach such things. The breadth of its interests and sources from texts through other things with writing such as coins to art history and on into archaeology avoids the artificial division so often perpetrated by institutional subdivision within universities. And indeed the School of History and Cultures with its medievalists and anthropologists adds to this mix. At the start I said that one of my main focuses would be identity. We all have multiple identities. I have emphasised two in the late Roman world, a civil one deriving from the past and from imperial and senatorial example, and a military one reflecting the straitened times for the empire and its emperors. It was, of course, to be the military identity that became more and more important, for men at least, in the succeeding centuries, both in what was left of the empire, but also for the various Germanic and other peoples who took over its territories in the west. Here in Britain, the Anglo-Saxons, the southwestern Gaul, the Visigoths, for instance. Germanic burials were thought to be distinctive with their burials, male burials furnished with the accoutrements of war, belts, brooches and necklaces for women, long considered to be self-evidently markers of identity dominated by ethnicity. Even this is now increasingly debated as archaeologists work through the realisation that considerations such as age, gender and status may have been as important, if not more important. When we can add to this the results of future work on stable isotopes and perhaps in due course ancient DNA and mitochondrial DNA, descending in the female line, um, then the potential for constructive confusion will be even greater. Archaeology will again have refashioned and continue to refashion the late Roman world. Thank you.